trying to prepare. So this is on a gym installer, which is an app I wrote. This is me. I work for Pivotal. It's one of the sponsors. And gym installer sort of goes against some of the conventional wisdom in, in Rails and or Ruby. Uh, I say don't underestimate the power of versions <coughs> and vendor nothing. Uh, you should have explicit dependencies and versions. Uh, try not to play fast and loose. Gem installer is, really comes down to YAML file. If, if any of you have ever used a Maven in Java, kind of the same concept. Specify everything and it automatically just is everywhere it needs to be. Looks like this. So it's really all about discipline. I'm sure all these screens will be sized wrong too. So this is the gem installer homepage. I've got spent some time writing some nice documentation and stuff, but basically automatically install all the correct versions of whatever you need, wherever your app runs, across multiple applications, machines, platforms, environments, and also make sure that all of those versions you specify are on your load path by the, uh, either the old required gem or gem command. Uh, automatically reinstall missing ones, which uh, is now built into Ruby gems. You can even, if you uh, are really disciplined, print out uh, all the gems that you don't have specified that somebody has uh, perhaps installed on your demo server to make it work, but not on your production. Avoid this syndrome here. And try to practice what I preach. Uh, I started Gem Installer about 0811, and I've maintained backwards compatibility with all of these versions as uh, Ruby Gems has evolved. And as you can see, they released uh, 110 this morning, which broke me which is really funny because yesterday I was green against truck, so go figure. Uh, I'll get on that. Uh, code coverage and stuff, try to be good. All the red you see is uh, versions of gem, Ruby gems, which I didn't run for this uh, archive suite, and I don't know how to consolidate them. And one really, really cool thing that I'm extremely excited about that just made it into Rails two days ago, it's not vendor everything, and it's not gem plugins, it lets gems be plugins. And you can see uh, David Hanner Meyer Hansen himself committed that a couple days ago. It's the same one who said, don't overestimate the power of versions. And the, the really important thing of this is this right here. Any gem that you load prior to your Rails app starting, you can detect by looking at the loaded specs and this patch here will put a hook in to Rails, uh, like init Rails. And if your gem has an init Rails method, then all the stuff that's in that gem in its specification to be on the load path is going to be on your Rails load path. So your gem can be a plugin if you have that hook. It's going to be really cool. So discipline. At, at Pivotal, it's probably, we have 50, 60 plus Rails developers. We are a very agile shop. We have lots of projects, lots of customers. Usually we get projects from nothing to out the door in just a few months. We do pair programming. We switch pairs, switch projects frequently. We switch pair stations frequently. We re-image re our machines uh, frequently. We deployed a lot of heterogeneous environments for different customers. We run everything on CI. We, um, we have lots of common plugins, both internal libraries, and we have plugins which provide application functionality which we sell and license to our customers. So in that environment, uh, you need to have more discipline than just a couple of guys hacking Rails apps. Nothing against that, but it's just a, a different environment. And if you don't have discipline, um, I think one of these. you should have bad guys come after you, scary guys. Guys like, uh, you know, TDD, BBD, whoops, got my slides out of order. This is what you want to do, show you this. That, we've all seen that guy. He's, he's kind of scary, but we've seen him a lot, you know. That guy's a little bit more scary, huh? That guy's that kind of kind of scary, but uh, you know if you're if you're the kind of developer that 
will install a plugin that has a dependency, manually install that gem on your workstation, and just fist that up into CI and all your other uh, developers on your team. Huh? Can I, can I get... Okay. I ask for permission rather than forgiveness. All right, just a few more. That, that's the guy that you uh, really don't want on your team. Don't. He's not there. <laughs> and uh, you deploy the demo, you know, that's the guy you really don't uh, want on your team. Scary guys. So, code. Nafuha. This is how it works. One uh, flat argument against gems is you don't want to depend on Ruby Forge. You don't have to do that. Here's some gems that I uh, have on my server. Here's a local gem server. And run gem installer. Right, everything is installed. So I'm going to uninstall Mongrel, which is a native gem. Run it again. It's going to automatically install that for me. So that's cool. Um, what's cooler is over here, the, uh, it's a hook. Here's how it hooks into Rails. It's a pre-initializer hook. Boot.rb, this is a patch I got into Rails. This runs before Rails initializes. So there's the two steps. There's installing your gems and auto gem, which is putting them on the load path. And so then when you run your Rails app, it's going to make sure everything's already installed. And here's a sample Rails app. This is included as a fixture in, a, in gem installer itself. This is showing all the stuff that's gone to the load path. How many of you uh, vendor your Rails to have different versions? Well, like, like I said, with our plugins and lots of different projects, we want to make sure that stuff works against multiple Rails versions. So we can do, you, you saw right here, I'm running Rails 202, which is the default latest one in my gym. I'm going to export this environment variable. Whoops, restart my server. Come back over here. Boom. I'm automatically running 1990. And like I showed over here on my uh, CI build, you can do the same thing. You can have your CI building against all of the versions of Rails that you need to support for all of your libraries, which has saved our ass a lot of times. Um, the little bit more code. The one cool thing it can do is you can include different configs, which I've got here. So to, to stay dry, you can have this in a common place shared across your projects. And all of these YAML files are parsed through ERB. So they, you can pretty much do whatever you want in it. If it doesn't do what you want, write some ERB to do it. And that's how I accomplished the Rails version uh, patch. And it works on Windows almost. Uh, it was working until Ruby Gems 1.0 working on that. Anyway, thanks a lot. All right. I'm glad I'm second. That's why all the dumb stuff that's in my presentation isn't beaten completely to death yet. But uh, we, we shall see. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys uh, a little thing I did with uh, Twitter plus XMPP, which is Jabber, for those of you who don't know, plus Ruby equals ZOMG. Uh, this is a solemn sombrero saga. So who am I? I'm Jade Meskill. I'm the founder of Integrum. We do Ruby on Rails consulting. There's our site. There's our blog. Uh, <laughs> Magical. Again, here we go. 
Okay, so why, why would you want to use uh, XMPP integration with Twitter uh, versus their API? Their, the XML API they provide is a, is a really, really great API, but it, it produces a lot of load on their servers. So they, they limit you to 70 requests per hour, and they actually scale that back when they're under heavy load. Uh, XMPP allows you to instantly respond to a message that you may get. Um, saves Twitter money and server load. So I'm going to show you guys just a little bit of code here. <clears throat> uh, I stole most of this from some post I found on the internet uh, by this guy. I'll give you the resource at the end. Uh, he did a lot of the heavy lifting. He built a really nice uh, abstraction, uh, created a, a Jabber bot that at its core just does very, very little, uh, then built a Twitter bot on top of that that integrates with Jabber. The one thing that he didn't do that, that I really loved is inside of every XMPP message from Jabber is an Atom feed that contains a whole bunch of the data, uh, metadata about the message that you received. So it's not just the text message itself. So what I did is I, I pulled that out and I used the uh, Twitter gem and basically emulated uh, the XML API. Uh, that's this block of code right here, to, uh, to be able to pass it off to my Rails app or whatever I want uh, to treat it just the same as if I was using the, the regular Twitter API. Uh, then what you do is you create a specific implementation of your Twitter bot and you can do all kinds of callbacks, cool stuff. Uh, I'll have code that you guys can download at the end. So I'm trying to keep this nice and brief. Uh, this is purely gratuitous sombrero action. <clears throat> no sombreros here. Well, maybe a little one. Uh, so I uh, stole, I mean, uh, I guess forked is the new steel. Uh, <laughs> I stole this from uh, this guy. Uh, at Intergram, we built a couple of uh, silly Rails apps. Uh, one is Twitter sign. If you see a cool sign, you can send us a message. Uh, and it will create these nice little signs. Uh, one of my favorites is, we saw this in Austin, where are you? Almost never closed, Monday through Friday. That's pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, Warn children of death by electrical shock, great. Uh, another small thing we built is a little app called Props. You can give your friends or enemies props or drops through Twitter, uh, and it will keep track of that. You can go to twitterprops.com to check that out. Uh, we built the iPhone interface and then a real full-fledged web interface is coming soon. Uh, let's see. At GitHub, I have uh, the actual code that we use for Twitter sign, the Rails app, the Jabber integration, everything. You guys are free to clone it, do whatever you want with it. Should give you a nice little head start if you want to build something similar, something similar to Overheard or what we're doing. Uh, things you must do, visit my blog, uh, give me props for being so awesome, and give me drops for shameless self-promotion. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So let's see. Um, okay, this. Uh, well, I'm the CatchDB guy. Uh, thanks for st sticking around. I'm not explaining CatchDB again. Um, uh, for those who weren't here, CatchDB stores um, the basic oh, I'll get it um, the basic storage thing in CatchDB is a document, and documents can have attachments. What I did here, oh, I can do that. Sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. Uh, where is my thing? I can't seem to what. Sorry? Sorry, what? I got that. Okay. Oh, what, uh, what kind do you need? Thanks. Sorry. Um, so, uh, 
Uh, what I did here, I created a simple uh, application that is just an HTML page. I put that HTML page into a CouchDB document attachment. Uh, for all of those who can read the URI here, um, uh, I'm on my lo local machine, local installation of CouchDB in the demo database, and I have this special document uh, called app, and I have the attachment main HTML. This is an actual HTML page, and I'm querying CouchDB Live from the browser here on my local machine, showing this to you. Um, now, uh, this is a very, very simple message board. Um, I can answer uh, add new, new topics here. There's nothing special about it. Um, and uh, other people can also do this. Uh, when I click on the topic here, I can see my text. Other, people's, other well, folks can reply. Uh, might have seen the chicken presentation. Um, so this is a very, uh, very basic application. Um, the cool thing about this, as I said, that it runs directly from CouchDB. When I fill out the form below and submit it, uh, a JavaScript uh, AJAX call talks actually to CouchDB, puts the data into CouchDB, and then reloads the current page, which uh, triggers another um, AJAX call that reads the actual topics and the um, the threads, or the, the discussion thing here, uh, works in the same way. Uh, this is very unspectacular. Uh, what I'm going to sh show now is, no, um, we have, there, there's uh, another CouchDB server running on the internet, um, and we get this error message when we call the same URI on this remote server. Uh, that is because I didn't do replication. That is what I want to show here, to how to replicate the, the application and the data over um, over to another uh, remote server. Uh, so we go to the CouchDB administration interface. So that's the built-in in, uh, administration interface of CouchDB of the installation I have on my notebook here. And there's a replicator thing. And I now want to replicate the local demo database to the remote database that lives. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Let's see if I can copy and paste. That here. And what now happens is the, the application, the document with the application in it and all the, the files that build, build the application, as well as the uh, discussion I just put in, will be replicated to the, to the remote server. Or it takes us a minute or second or two, depending on how fast the internet is. I hope that works. Um, that's probably slow. <laughs> Sorry for the delay here. Uh, in the meantime, I can paste the URI that you'll be able to access uh, the remote server as well. Uh, it seems my Safari just went away. Uh, okay, that, that's kind of a bummer. I've got to try again. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so, uh, could you can you guys open the the URI I just posted on on IRC? Uh, do you, do you get something there? Uh, no, that's wrong. Okay, try again. J. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's that's just too bad that the internet doesn't work at the moment. Oh, it does. It's just very slow. Um, Okay, the replication apparently did work. We just need to wait another second here. Uh, what happened is that I have now a remote database server that, uh, the CouchDB server that uh, just got the application, including all the data for the application from my notebook replicated to the other machine. And I might have given you the wrong URI. Try, uh, sorry. Um, how do I get here? Sorry, um, you. I hope no, that doesn't work. Okay, uh, everyone who's on IRC now gets another URI that's actually actually pointing uh, to this application. Now you can use this application. Please add some comments there. Would would like to would like you to invite to do that. Um, you can. Uh, oh, sorry. Kind of a mess here. So uh, if I disagree, I say, well, if I've got a new, new topic, foo, blah, uh, 
I send this to the remote so it will take again a bit. Okay, this is shoddy with the internet, I'm sorry. Uh, it should, should have been better. Okay, this is totally a non-success here. <laughs> <laughs> kind of embarrassing. What I, what I plan to show is that what is, what is possible here is we have now this application that, will, that lived only on my machine with a discussion board now lives on a different machine where other people can use it. And when they, these people on, on other people can get the replication as well, when the discussion that happened on the other machine can, now, can then be replicated back to my machine and I would be able to engage in, into the discussion even if I'm offline, or which I'm apparently at the moment. <laughs> Um, so uh, that should have been a cool demonstration of how to do distributed applications running on CouchDB. You don't have to do the JavaScript thing like I do. You can, can do a, Ju a Ruby application in between uh, or whatever you want to have in between. Um, the idea is that there's no central database server that serves all the requests, but all the people who use the application are the actual, actual uh, nodes. It's more of a peer-to-peer -peer application thing. And everyone who wants to engage in this application can then rep replicate from and to all the peers to build eventually all the, the discussion that is going on. I'm very sorry that didn't work with the, uh, with the internet here. OK, thanks. So I'll not, I'm not going to try any further. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, yesterday morning we were talking about ASCII art animation on the, uh, the back channel, and I tossed out something I'd done in a, a golfing, Ruby golfing tournament a couple of years ago. So hopefully this isn't uh, too much for anybody. Um, Jim Wyrick asked if this was an, a noun or a verb. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at one line of code in something under five minutes. Do we really want to do this? Is it worth this? Yeah. Woohoo. Almost read it up there in the corner. <laughs> okay, caveat first simple is better than magic. Don't try to be clever. Ruby golf is a really bad idea. <laughs> and as Zen Spider said when he saw the code, that's evil. <laughs> <laughs> Starts out innocuously enough, right? We, we are going to set up a loop. Um, we'll set up a counter. And then we'll start printing lines. Um, we're going to start out by the first thing we're going to uh, print is clearing the screen, then going back up to the upper left and printing uh, 11 spaces with a underline at the end. We'll print eight more spaces and then the, uh, the body of the duck, remember? Uh, not much. It actually gets worse if I try to make it bigger. So. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and quack. And here's where the counter comes in, right? We're going to check um, to see whether we're even or odd, and then we're either going to print a closed beak or a quack and an open beak. <laughs> then we're going to uh, hit a new line in another 10 spaces um, and the bottom of the deck, but we're going to proceed that in those 10 spaces um, again, I guess real quickly, um, checking to see um, whether we're even or odd and then creating the waves. So, and then we're going to, what does sleep, sleep one return? Returns one. So I plus equals sleep one, you, you get the count and you get to uh, increment your counter. It's awesome. <laughs> don't try this at home, really, don't. Hi. So who's familiar with Coco? Can we raise hands? Okay, good number. And who's running OS 10 Macintosh laptops or desktop at home? Good deal. So Coco is, for those that don't know, it's Apple's framework uh, written in Objective-C um, to do the display stuff and to access um, various resources. Uh, image kit, so you can take a picture of yourself with the camera. Help me out. Good deal. Okay. Um, and uh, 
it just covers a broad range. So uh, one thing that I have been doing is using EC2 for my staging environment. I boot it up and I do some stuff for a couple hours and I shut it down for weeks at a time until I need it again. Um, and I've been unhappy with the Firefox EC2 manager thing. So one thing I started last night was a Ruby Coco app. So Ruby Coco is, if it's not obvious, it lets you talk to Coco through Ruby. Um, it's something Apple has adopted in Leopard. So if you've got Xcode, which I imagine almost everyone here does that is running OS X, um, then you have access to Ruby Coco. So we're going to try and do a first iteration of a uh, EC2 manager in Ruby Coco in as fast as I can. So we'll create a new project. And the first thing we'll do is uh, lay out the interface. And this is gorgeous. There we go. Nope. Okay, so the two things we'll need are uh, two text fields for our Amazon Web Services um, key and secret uh, button to bonk on to make it go and do its thing. We could just check to see if they're both filled in and whatnot, but we'll do the button. And, uh, sorry. a table view to show the uh, results. Uh, I don't recommend this UI, but, uh, you know, we do what we do with the time we have. Uh, so the first thing we need now that the UI is laid out um, is a controller to run everything. Uh, so we're going to go in, and they've got a nice little Ruby NS window controller subclass. We're just going to call it EC2 Mugger Controller. And it goes and creates that. And I'm going to cheat. Um, I've got text clippings for the things I need that have been scattered about. Um, but the first thing we need is obviously to require Ruby gems. And the, we're going to use the right AWS uh, gem that Jonathan talked about before. Um, and the next, next thing we need to do is we need to be able to access um, the two fields so that we can pump them into write AWS and the text area. So the way you do that in uh, Coco is you set up an outlet. And the way you do that in Ruby Coco is you tell your um, controller IB outlet, and then you give it a name. And then with that, we can go back to Interface Builder. And we need to create an instance of our controller. So this is a lot of hand-waving. There's um, a good book on Coco that I actually would recommend um, by Aaron Hillegas. But now that we have that, we need to go and tell it that it's supposed to be an EC2 mugger. We draw some lines here, tell it this is our access ID, this is our secret key, and then this guy is our instance table view. Um, and then now we have instance variables within this class to access those things. Um, we now need the action to go ahead and talk to write AWS to load it in. Um, so we just pass in our access ID, our secret key, and then we call this, sorry, describe images by owner um, just by self since <laughs> We don't want too much. Um, and then we tell it this is an IB action, interface builder action. So now when I save that and go back to interface builder, I can drag the other way, going from the button to the controller and telling it to line that up with the, uh, that load instance action that we just dragged in there. So then, I don't know what number I'm on, fourth maybe. We need to tell the table view that our controller is also a, its data source. And uh, that's also just a Coco deal. Um, so now it's going to ask the instance of the controller, you know, what's, OK, thanks. Um, it's going to ask for these two default uh, methods. So we're going to basically implementing this interface for number of rows and table view. 
Um, and we're going to say instances.size, and I don't know, that rescue is there for fun. Um, and then this table view under object value. These names are hideous because of the way the bridging is working. Um, anyone who's done Objective-C knows you do the funky brackets and you pass colons and everything's named and it's actually quite nice once you get used to it. But uh, this is how they decided to do, translate the, uh, the two things. So now we are wired up as our data source. We have implemented things. And the one thing that I'm doing here is um, in instances I'm calling the row and then I'm using this column that's passed in over here. I'm using its identifier as a symbol to access that, so we actually have to go fill that in. Um, so we need to tell this, not that. The table column, this is gonna be AWS ID, and this is just part of the right scale stuff, and this is gonna be AWS location. And I think if I'm at all lucky, I can drag in my ID, my secret. And this is little snitch telling me it's actually going out to EC2, and it loaded those instances. So the next step would be able to start one, stop them, um, you know, all that stuff that it doesn't do. Um, but that's it. Thanks. I've been working on, so I will have to make a confession here. I am definitely guilty of uh, being a polyglot. I love Ruby, but uh, I, I sometimes live the second life of being a I.O. hacker. Uh, so polyglot means a person who knows or is able to use several languages. And uh, so what is I.O.? Well, I'm not talking about input-output. Um, not talking about the moon orbiting around Jupiter, or this. <laughs> I'm talking about a programming language. So here is Hello World in I.O. You take a string, and I'm telling it to print itself out. Here's something a little more involved. Uh, it's basically, you know, the 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Uh, this, I'm trying to show the more familiar aspects of the language. You've got your shebang at the top. You've got a, you know, a function uh, that has a couple ifs in there and you know, a return. And then you've got some sort of a for loop. You can kind of figure out what it's doing and some writes there. Um, but yeah, IO is objects, though. And, and, and I want to show that more so because, you know, well, idiomatic IO code really uh, takes advantage of this. So here, here's another uh, example. Um, we build an account and we have a balance and deposit. I really don't want to go into depth in explaining this. It'd take too long. But uh, there are a couple interesting things to, uh, to note about this. Uh, first of all, there are no classes in I.O. Um, it's all just objects. Now, yes, in Ruby, classes are objects themselves. But it literally is um, just objects uh, implementing an entire uh, object protocol and object system. Um, so we call these prototypes in I.O. And prototypes can be inherited. So you can take a prototype and say, I'm inheriting from this prototype. You can change these prototypes on the fly in I.O. So you can decide one minute that uh, you're a car and another minute that you're an airplane. Uh, it's up to you. It can be uh, quite absurd sometimes, but uh, sometimes this flexibility uh, is needed. So uh, the, the other thing is there could be multiple prototypes, so uh, you, you can do some pretty creative uh, things with dispatch. Um, there can also be zero prototypes if you want to be some sort of root object with nothing else uh, backing it. Um, there's another cool thing about IO's object model. Um, the inheritance uh, between these prototypes is differential, and what that means really shortly is that uh, when, when you take an object, your prototype, um, you want to specialize it, and uh, you, you take that and you clone it. Um, we, we can go back up to this, and you see I'm taking a generic object and cloning it and making a count set to that with, with some custom stuff inside, you know, the balance, deposit, and show stuff. Um, but uh, th there's one special thing about the differential inheritance. What this means is you only store the... the uh, 
the differences between your prototype and yourself, not a complete copy. And what it means is it's really easy to go back and monkey patch and you know, change and update code. Um, it makes for a really, really nice uh, language you know, that leaves everything open. That there's there's nothing, uh, nothing sacred in I.O. Um, so can Ruby do this, I guess, would be one question. Why, why I.O. at all? Um, and uh, it almost can. It's uh, not quite as dynamic in a, a number of ways, but it's got some cool, cool hacks you can do. Um, from the Ruby internals talk, you might be able to understand some of this code. So I'm just creating this class. I'm naming it proto. You could do the whole you know, class proto semicolon end there, but you know, this, this is self-explanatory. Anyway, I'm one minute. I'm, I'm defining uh, Cologne on the, on the uh, class uh, proto. And uh, you, you can see how uh, you know, I can, I can uh, basically create some sort of a prototype-like object system right in Ruby. Problem is that you still can't have multiple uh, parent prototypes. You can't change them on the fly and other things like that. So sometimes that isn't enough in, you know, with what Ruby gives. Sometimes you really do need uh, some sort of expressive uh, environment to you know, build a DSL or build a very, very specific language for something. Um, here's a quick method uh, that I wrote a few years ago. I'm not going to explain it since it's probably going to take too much time. But anyway, uh, th this uh, allows at the very bottom uh, the, uh, the two lines to work. Um, it's, uh, Basically, functions like um, Ruby's inject, but uh, I'm completely doing everything dynamically. I'm deciding what, uh, what should be a uh, variable name, what should be a value, and what should just be executed like code. Um, Lisp coders uh, will definitely uh, recognize this sort of uh, setup. Uh, you can definitely use your code as data, and data can be used as code just as easily. Um, so it isn't all simple all, that all, all the time. You look at this code and you can see uh, you know, quite a bit of, uh, well, internals. You, you, you're dealing with the AST and stuff. But just like in Lisp, you can, you can build up your language and, and make this look a lot nicer. Uh, I just don't have uh, time to show that. Um, so IO is really cool because it's also largely written in itself. and. Uh, some of it isn't written in itself for uh, performance reasons, you know, in C right now, but uh, it's all writable in I.O. So there are a lot of things, you know, if you wanted to make it inspectable, you, you can go ahead and write it in I.O. and check out the code at runtime, change it, uh, mutate it, uh, a lot of crazy things. Uh, so my question is, why can't I have both? I, I really like using a lot of different languages. So I.O. is one of those, and uh, Ruby is another. So. I started this project uh, a little while ago called Iodine, which is not released yet. It's not quite ready. I did some hacking on it uh, the other night, but not quite finished. There's some major bugs. So uh, soon to be released on GitHub. But it implements IO on top of Ruby. Um, and soon Rubinius is my goal. However, uh, I, I started with that goal. and. Uh, they just made too much progress. Keeping up with their progress uh, was actually the, uh, the hard part. Uh, they, they would change enough of the VM often enough that uh, I just decided to uh, wait and, and uh, start with just Ruby. Um, it's really cool for things like uh, secure code, uh, sandboxing. You can really uh, build custom environments. You want to run untrusted code. Uh, really, really easy for that sort of stuff. Um, really, really kick-ass DSLs. If you think Ruby's good at DSLs, IO is definitely the next step up. Um, very embeddable. It's a very lightweight language at the core, so you can take what you want. You don't have to bring a lot of baggage with it. And uh, the concepts are very simple, so it's usually easy to implement and easy to uh, adapt to whatever language you want to bridge it with. Um, it's experimenter friendly, so like I mentioned with monkey patching and just being able to attach and look at and reflect on just about any part of the language, uh, it's really great for that. Um, so right now, status, I hope to release some alpha code on GitHub and you know, 
maybe the next week, and uh, hopefully by GoRuco with a conference-driven development schedule, I'll, uh, I'll do a, a more official release. Um, so here are some further resources. You can go to iolanguage.com, the official site, to read more about IO. I've got iodine.net that I'm going to be setting up soon. It's not really, uh, there's nothing really there right now. Um, you can go to IO on Freenode, and there are a lot of helpful people. I'm usually there as Binary42, so give me a ring. Um, you can check out the IO repository on GitHub right now. Um, I'll be putting my stuff there as well. And if you have questions, you can email me at this address. Any questions? No questions. No questions. Okay, done. done. Okay. <laughs>so my name is Jeremy Stelsmith. I'm from Pivotal Labs, and there's been a lot of talk about um, fixtures and how much how painful they are. So we're doing some cool things on the last couple of projects I've been on, and I just wanted to share them with you guys. Um, is that big enough? So um, there's a, a pattern that they mentioned a couple talks ago, um, object daddy. I actually know it is object mother. Um, and it's just using a factory instead of your test. It's been around like since 2001. Uh, somebody at ThoughtWorks wrote it up. Um, and so you, some, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to specify stuff in your test and just skip fixtures altogether. Um, one thing that you can do in Ruby is you can actually use DSLs for that. DSLs are, are really well suited to representing hierarchical data. And as you can see, uh, procedural language is really not, like if you, if you have a procedural style. Like that's just really painful code right there. So this, this domain I kind of made up to kind of mirror, um, very simply, uh, my last project that I was on. Um, and so in this domain, uh, there's a company. Companies have sites. Sites have buildings. So a site is like a city, like Los Angeles or San Francisco. Um, buildings have contractors or locations. So a, a much better way to, to show this, to, to build it using active record, is that DSL. I mean, it's pretty simple. I, I, at, at, if we have time at the end, I'll just show you like what the code behind that looks like. That took about half an hour to build that DSL, and it's it's infinitely more readable. Yeah. So if you can do that inside of your test, that's actually to me easier and more expressive than a factory. You can obviously make that more complicated, more keywords. You can put you know, you can add things like uh, what, whatever other fields you have there as you need to. But things that are implicit here are like who the parent is, and it's very visual, and it models the domain much better. Um, so that's one thing. Um, sometimes, though, like I, I like to use fixtures. My, my big gripes with fixtures were that you had to uh, maintain YAML, which is just painful, um, and that they were global. So one thing we've already talked about was fixture scenarios. So that solves a global problem, because you can have different fixtures for, for different scenarios. And within your test, you can, um, for example, For example, here, um, you would just say scenario simple company. So I conceivably have like multiple scenarios. One of them is simple company that just has a couple locations. And, and then you're not polluting the whole namespace. You don't have, you change this one uh, scenario or this one fixture, and it breaks all your tests because you have multiple small uh, uh, groups of fixtures. Um, the other problem with scenarios is that they were in Ruby, as I said. So there's something called scenario builder that I, I didn't write. Somebody else wrote it. Um, I think it's on Google Code. There you go. Um, and it's, it's awesome. Basically, it, it solves that problem completely. So um, what you do is you, you define a scenario as RB file, put it in your um, spec or test fixtures directory, and you just define a scenario. And you can define that in active record. Um, if you put that together with defining your data in DSLs, all of a sudden you have something that's really, really powerful and much, much easier to maintain um, than, than just YAML. Uh, we, we were talking about problems with validations not being run. Um, all that stuff is just it's taken care of because it's active record. Um, one, one thing that I still do and that you can do with, fixture, with scenario builders, you can still have um, manual fixtures. So occasionally I might have something that, that is actually it's invalid data or it's something that active record won't get, let me get into a certain state and I can still go all the way to the YAML and actually check those files in. But the other YAML is just generated every time, every time I change this file. So here we see uh, this is the simple site example. And... Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, yeah? So there's a, a 
a simple company that has two, build, uh, two sites, one building in each site, and two locations. Here's a more, uh, a more complicated example. It kind of just makes sense. Um, and I definitely don't use this all the time. Like, for example, uh, one, one good example, uh, one common thing that, that happens is uh, you actually want to do a lot of stuff with the data and you don't want to expect to get exactly certain things back um, that require a lot of knowledge of what's actually in the fixture. Or you just want that for like one specific test. In those cases, I don't bother putting it into a scenario. I just put it in line. And because I have that DSL, it's really easy to do that. So in this case, um, we're trying to have copy pasting of a site from one company to another. And so I just go ahead and create my company uh, just with the stuff that I need for that one test. And then over here, uh, one thing that, another thing that, another pattern that we do a lot of is round tripping. So this is the, that's the Ruby to create the active records. And the active records know how to create the Ruby that you use for them. So basically, um, after I do a paste of, of this site A, um, it should look something like this. And that's, that's like readable by me as a human. Cool. So that's pretty much it. If you have any questions or want to know more, just go to uh, my blog. Ah, crap. I hate that. Uh, my blog at onemanswalk.com. It should be up there like tomorrow the next day or just email me at jeremystelsmith at gmail. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, punch is a, uh, something we all like to do is track our time. Punch is a command line time tracker written by Aira. He's not here, so I'm doing this for him. Anyway, it's super lightweight. It's just a single user on your computer. It's punch card style. You punch in, you punch out. It has YAML storage. Uh, it's super easy syntax, and you can gem install punch if you want to use it. This is the syntax. Punch in and your project name. You can punch in an hour ago. It uses the chronic uh, gem. You can punch clock something you did before. So the first, first argument is when you started, and then the second argument is when you finished. So that would, that would basically punch in an hour and a half on the project name project. Uh, you can punch in on a project and give it a task name. So you're, the dash M is a message, so you're talking about punch. While you're in a project, you can send a log if you're switching to a different task. So you basically say punch log, the project name, and then whatever you want, and the quotes are optional. So both uh, two and three there kind of do the same thing. Um, then you can punch out of a project right now, or you can punch out 20 minutes ago or whenever you finished. And then this is how you do your reporting. Punch list will give you a list of all your projects. Uh, punch total will give you a total of every project. Um, a punch total after yesterday will tell you how much time you spent yesterday, or after yesterday, which is today. Um, uh, anyway, then you can do after last week, and then you can punch list project, and it'll list all the, all the time records you have. All the output in punch is YAML, so you can pipe this into something else, or you can get it in a, some Ruby app. You can just um, run this command into an I.O., and read it and do whatever you want with it. And you can punch list what you did in January by doing after January 1 and before January 30th. And then you can punch dump or punch dump a project and that'll give you the raw, the raw uh, YAML that uh, this was done as. And then uh, the, the data is stored in your home directory in .punch.yaml. You can just edit that file and do whatever you want. Okay, punch is, punch is written using main. Main is totally different than punch. Um, main is basically a controller for your command line apps. And it's used actually by a lot of people. How many people use main? Okay, not as many as I thought. Okay. Anyway, main, main basically makes it really easy to, to write command line applications. And it does a whole bunch of stuff for you. It's an, it's an excellent example of a DSL. So this is a main app right here. Um, you require main, and then you have main and a block. That's the, every main app has a main and a block. And then the mode 
is the first argument after your application. So if you, if you typed on the command line myapp.rb install, it would run the block that's inside mode. So that, this, is, this is kind of the bare bones main app. Um, some of the advantages of main is it has the, this unification of options, arguments, keywords, and environment. Um, it auto-generates auto generates usage and help and validation. Um, you, the modes can be multiple levels deep, so you can say install my thing right now, and it would, it would, you could go into your whole block, block inside block inside block till you got to the thing you actually wanted to do. Um, has I, IO redirection, logging, has error handling and exit codes, and you can use your own DSL, there's no namespace collisions of anything, and it parses argv and all that stuff. Okay, don't I get 10 minutes since I'm doing two things? <laughs> okay, let me go really fast here. So anyway, it, these are the arguments you can pass in. I'm gonna flip through these, you can read these online after, actually just go to codeforpeople.com and rubylib and you can read the readme for all these things. These are all the options you can pass an option. And so this is a little bit more involved one. You basically have the main block and then you say what arguments you, you're gonna have. The arguments come in ordered in, on the command line. You have keywords, you have an options, and you have the environment. And this app basically would output this. So these line up with each other. So if I ran this command line, um, this is the output it would, it would do. And then this is help. So basically if you type your app dot dash dash help or dash h, it automatically outputs this based on the code on the, le on the left here. So all of that stuff is done for you. And this is some advanced stuff where you can have mix-ins into your main. So if you have common um, arguments or keywords that are used on multiple modes, you can mix them in. So you only define them once and then you mix them into your, um, into your mode that you're currently in. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Okay, so one of the really awesome things about working in JRuby is that you can bundle all of your Ruby code into a jar. Um, and what that means is nobody actually really knows that you're working with JRuby. It's all just Java. And so you can leverage all the things that come with Java. JRuby is just a library that happens to be packaged with it. So you can just double click your jar there. And after a few seconds, it'll pop up your app. Even though the app is almost completely driven by um, you know, Ruby code. Uh, how that applies to Java Web Start is that um, I can give somebody a link and it just downloads and runs the app. I already have it downloaded because it's about a six meg download. And so there's my application. Now, I can make a change, change our red text to blue, to green. Save it there. Uh, that's the wrong one. I have to sign the jars. And then I can transfer that over to uh, my main server here. Wow, this is annoying. And so on my server. Now when I run it again, it automatically grabs the latest version and starts up the app. Oh, 
now the text should appear as green. Um, so you've got auto updating. Uh, Java Web Start will also install uh, desktop shortcuts and uh, among other things. So uh, that's really all I have to show. Any questions? Do I have time for questions? Or? Any questions? Uh, it's a weird security thing with Java. You have to sign your jars in order for them to be trusted. Uh, I'm using kind of a temporary developer signing right now. So that's why it comes up and says this is untrusted. You shouldn't sure want this. Uh, I believe you have to go through VeriSign and actually pay them some money to sign the jars for real. Uh, anybody else? Yes, From the browser, it can, it can block basically the name of that. So long as you have Java installed. Okay. Yeah. So that originally was a shoot down, wasn't it? This, this is the remake making using monkey bars, which was the lightning talk we had yesterday. Six, six meg, is that the so, Yeah, JRuby Complete is about five megs, the jar for that. And that comes with the core lib. You could probably truncate that down by pulling out a lot of that stuff that you're not using. Okay, thank you. So this is a, a Rails helper we use uh, to save us a lot of time. They're auto-saving fields, so they're, they're um, input elements on a, on a web page that know what data they contain. So they know what object, what column, what table. So um, you say, like, auto-save username says, OK, well, that's, that's a field. And so you get this, this auto-saving field. I don't know, whatever. And then, you know. So it saves, so when you reload the page, you get the new value. Um, you know, say, uh, as select, you get select. You pass in some options. It tries to be as smart as possible. So if you pass in uh, active record objects, uh, well, let's get into that later. But you know, if you pass in like user prefixes is an array of string, um, and it knows, OK, you're storing the index in the database, and it, it gets the, the text from what you're passing in. Um, as check, you get a checkbox. So, um, but they're kind of ugly, so there's a, a pretty simple skinning system. You can create different appearances. So this is, you know, you click on it and you, you type in something. I'm just typing in gibberish. Um, you know, this is, a, this is the checkbox, a different appearance for the checkbox. It goes, is not. This is a different appearance for the uh, select box. You just get the options here and, you know, chooses whatever. And, um, you know, you go back to this and you can see that it saves. Uh, here's another simple appearance. You know, this is more like the you know edit in place. It's got a save and cancel button. Um, okay, so what else? Uh, it's got hookbacks. So um, if you give some JavaScript to call when you're successful, it'll call that. Um, you know, this has got a simple validation. So if um, the save's not successful, it calls a different JavaScript. Oh, um, actually, that's good. So to, to do the different skins, you just you just pass in the name of the skins. And uh, it looks in a directory for them. Again, edit button skin. Hookbacks is JavaScript is a successful one. Failure is the failure one. OK, so next, uh, associations. Um, it's got one-to-one -one associations. So whatever. Um, if we look at what that looks like, again, it's just the object and the, and the, um, the association. It asks Rails, okay, what kind of association? Oh, it's one to one, so we'll show a select box. Okay, it's type company, so let's get all the companies. Uh, if you don't want all the companies, you can either pass in just the array of the companies you want or a conditions clause, and it'll just get the ones matching the companies matching the conditions clause. Um, so again, both of these are just the ones starting with S. Um, uh, trying to get something lower on the page. I 
Okay, well, let's, let's do this the old-fashioned way. Just... Oh, I'm just going to... I can't seem to scroll, so I'm just going to get rid of the ones on the top of the page. Uh, One-to-many association, it gives you a whole bunch of checkboxes. Again, they're, they're all out of saving. Um, it saves time because you don't have to implement any of the back end. You know, it knows... It, it all goes through a single method that, that comes with the stuff. Uh, you don't have to implement any of it. Um, it's all sort of there. And then last is file upload. It's got a, a non-page reloading file upload. Um, well, let's do a simple. Anyway. So didn't reload the page. It updates the image. For that, you can pass in um, after and give it a, a function. And that's the function we'll call after. Um, in the case that you've got, um, in case you have a, a bunch of um, uh, uh, RJS um, calls you want to make through different afters, uh, it gives you also render, and it just it takes the block and just when it goes to render, it just passes all of them, so you don't have to worry about double rendering. Uh, and that's that's about it. So. That's me. I'm Jim Lindley. Um, I work for Academic Management Systems. Um, we do software for universities. Um, the problem we have is an app. Uh, it's currently in Visual Fox Pro, but we're converting it to Rails because Visual Fox Pro is discontinued. Um, it's a, um, some of the things we deal with are uh, surveys and questionnaires where each level at a university gets to add their own questions. So uh, um, the typical design of a form is problematic. Um, we can have up to 1,000 slightly different forms um, per install, uh, which is uh, pretty hairy. Um, so the issue I'm trying to solve is that we have to uh, heuristically generate some form layouts. Um, and I wasn't sure where to start, so I went back to basics. And uh, here's a Rails scaffold. Um, and it generates this sort of markup, which is fine. It gets the job done. Um, but to get to where we need to go is uh, uh, the form builder comes up. And uh, how many people here have made form builders before? Probably lots of you. Um, it's uh, um, basically just subclass the Rails form builder and uh, add your wrapping markup so you can get rid of some of those P's and B's. Um, it's pretty old news. It's been in Rails since, I think, uh, 1992. Um, all right, uh, Accessible Form Builder is a plugin I started with. Um, it allows you to add notes, uh, required asterisks, labels. Um, the markup looks like this. Uh, you can see a few lines down, uh, required, true. A few lines after that, note, be festive. Um, generates all this markup. Uh, there's not much HTML here. Uh, I think just the H1 at the top. Um, this is all pretty basic rail stuff. Uh, and it adds that required asterisk for age and the note at the end of headwear. Um, <laughs> All right, uh, so here's where I took it uh, from the existing plugin. Um, Blueprint is a CSS framework. Has anyone ever used it? Fair amount of people. Um, it uh, basically strips down all of the browser's default styles, builds it up, and gives you a little bit more. Uh, column layout, typography, default styles. Um, this form builder needs reset and grid files to work. Um, in uh, the form builder, in, uh, for like a text field, you would add a couple extra parameters. It would generate uh, blueprint CSS classes. Um, so here is a, a different example. And you can see um, like the top line, span six, that tells blueprint uh, CSS to apply uh, six columns to it. Um, and there's a slight shim to, grit, uh, to uh, blueprint CSS to help make some of this work. Um, so here's the layout. Um, from. Uh, this is this, no real HTML, and the CSS is just from Blueprint and the plugin. Um, you can get columns and uh, a few other niceties. Um, and the reason we need this is that uh, with all these different forms, we basically have to serialize the form layout. So we take the, um, all the different options hashes and dump it in the database, and then uh, when the user comes, you can generate the form from that. Um, so a, a nice, decent-looking form without too much work. Um, and additionally, all the, the existing Rails form helpers are uh, 
alias to, uh, with, with bear so that if you ever need to drop down, you can do that. Um, and uh, if you need uh, quick forms, prototyping, that sort of a thing, uh, you might find this useful. Um, I'm going to add some specs to the plugin that were non-existing, um, continue to add CSS to uh, make it more useful to people, and then um, eventually I will release the uh, corresponding plugin that serializes the form layouts. And then um, I'm hoping to create a uh, Flash Reflex um, GUI for editing forms uh, and generating code. Um, so uh, it's still work in progress. And here's some credits for the um, really good work I'm building off of. I don't know if either of those two gentlemen are here. But uh, if you are, thank you. And uh, that's it. Uh, it's on GitHub. And uh, thank you very much. My name is PJ Hyatt, and I'm one of the GitHub guys, along with Chris Wanstroth and Tom Preston Warner. That was actually a beautiful segue. The previous lightning talk had a project on GitHub. Uh, as soon as I figure out this display. Oops. Cool. Not cool. All right, so, well, as I'm, I'm sure most of you know what GitHub is because of the fact that half of the talks I've heard included their link to the GitHub project. Um, but for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, GitHub is a place to store your code using Git, which is an infinitely better source control management system than Subversion or CVS or anything that isn't distributed, basically. We can talk later if Mercurial is just as good or not. But um, So basically, if and I'll give you the email at the end of my talk, so if you want an invite and you don't have one, feel free to email me. But this is, this is what you'll see uh, when you first get to GitHub, and I'm just going to do this locally in case the network gets flaky, but you'll come to GitHub and you'll say, well, there's this really awesome project that I want to work on. I mean, GitHub does host private code, but one of the awesome features is how well it does open source. And what we're doing is we're not... We're, we're making Git even more awesome than it already is by exposing these things via the web interface. So as a, instead of the, the, the way you would do it with Subversion where you patch things, and I'm, I'm sure all of you know that patches can be extremely problematic and just a, a general pain in the ass. So Git simplifies that, and I will show you how. So there's this really awesome library that we're using on GitHub called Grit. It's something Tom's been working on. It's a Ruby interface for Git, a Ruby wrapper, rather. And so I would like to fork that. And one of the previous talks said fork is another word for steal. You know, call it what you want. But um, it's as simple as clicking fork and memcache is down. <laughs> That's what I do, get for doing this uh, locally. Um, let me just restart this. I guess I could just use the real website. Uh, let me try that one more time. No? Okay, well, let's use the actual website and see what happens. I'm sorry? I've got my, I've though. Uh, all right, so we're really, <laughs> we're, uh, let's see how many things can go wrong for this. All right, so I'm going to do the exact same thing, only on the real website. This is Tom's Grit application, and I'm going to fork it. So I just click fork, and doing some hardcore forking action, I, uh, I'm now going to have my own copy of Grit. And this really depends on whether the network is going to... There we go. So here's my own copy. And the beautiful thing is, is that now, if I want to make changes to Grit, I, I use this URL, I, I clone it, and 
pull it in, do my changes, and go go back to Tom's original Tom's original grit library and go and go and go where is the pull request do I not even know how to use my own website that is the question um Apparently not. Oh, it's, that's, yeah, that's why. Um, so let me just pull up one of my own repos so I can tell you how this is actually supposed to work. Um, that's for later. So let's say this is this is one of my project auto migrations. Um, there we there we go. Auto migration. So let's assume that I've actually cloned this and it's not my own project. I go, I click pull request and I go, hey dude, just made some incredible changes. Check it out. And I don't know why I would add myself, but actually, this is strange. There's, I don't think the Ajax is working properly. <laughs> but let's assume that I send this pull request. Maybe, maybe this will work. But um, essentially what it's doing is it'll say, hey, Tom, I, I just made this awesome change set. Um, pull in my repository that I forked from you. And instead of dealing with this whole patching you know, scenario, that can be so problematic. One of the things that Git does very well is merge. And so what he would do is he would pull in my, my clone uh, into a remote branch and he would just uh, merge my branch with his branch and then it's all taken care of. So there is, it's, it's essentially what you would do uh, for everything is that you merge as opposed to patch and that is one thing Git does very well. So the idea is that instead of giving people commit access, they just have to like you enough to merge your branch in. So as in, you know, if, you, if you wanted to uh, work on some Rails patches that involve you know, some, some major changes, you don't have to ask them to make a special branch for you. You just clone it yourself, or fork it rather. You fork it, you do all your work, and then People are like, hey, this fork is actually really awesome. And they go, all right, well, we'll just merge it in. So I think it's incredibly powerful for how it, I think it's, it's definitely an evolution for the open source community on, on the flexibility and, and how easy it is to, to get, a copy of your pro, uh, get a copy of another project, do all your awesome changes, and then tell them that you know, they should think about merging it. So I'm probably preaching to the choir because I know like I said, half of you are already using it. But for those that aren't, please email me at pj at Logical Awesome, and I'm happy to give you an invite. But that was probably the worst demo I could have possibly have given you guys. Um, but there you go. All right, I'm going to show off SQL real quick. Uh, SQL is a Ruby library that lets you access databases easily. Um, just dive into some code. So you basically require Ruby gems, require SQL. Um, there's a couple ways of connecting to different databases. You can give it a URI, so that's how you would connect to a MySQL database. Give it a user, pass, host, DB name, whatever. Um, you can also pass in a hash with different options instead of a URI. So you could connect to Postgres like that. Uh, you can connect to SQLite, just give it a file name. Or uh, for this demo, I'm just going to do, if you don't give the SQLite a file name, it's just going to create a database in memory. 
Um, so we have this DB object that has a database connection. We attach a logger to it. Um, you could use the standard lib logger like this, just basically assign the logger. Um, so here we're going to create a simple table. Has three fields. Um, this uses method missing to basically pass on whatever string down to the database. So whatever your database supports, you can use in your schema. So at its core, uh, SQL is basically ha has this concept of a data set which lets you build SQL using Ruby. So uh, the, m the simplest data set is basically you take your database connection and say you're accessing numbers. So this means you're basically doing a select all from the numbers table which we just created up here. So if I run this you can see um, basically the SQL generated by that second command is select star from numbers. So uh, we'll go ahead and populate this with some, a couple rows, run it again. You can see it's inserting a bunch of data. Um, you can see in here I'm using time.now and n days ago and it knows to convert that into whatever your database wants. Um, we can go ahead and start querying the database. So when you do a dot print it basically does a nice little ASCII graph. Uh, you can see it's doing a select star for numbers. Uh, you can start applying filters to your data set and this uses parse tree as kind of like ambition so you can basically pass in Ruby code in a block and it will convert that to SQL. So over here we're doing, uh, we're taking this base data set and calling where on it and we say uh, anything in your block that's a symbol is considered a field in your database. So we're saying look up basically all rows where the num field is uh, in this range and is smart enough to know that a range converts to an inquiry in SQL. And you can change chain data sets. So we're assigning it to this variable over here and then we chain and we add another clause which is an order clause and then we print it out so you can see um, it builds this query. It knows how to deal with that range and we're printing out those values from the table. Uh, same thing, we can apply a different order clause and now it's ordering by alphabetically by the name. Um, we can call delete on any data set and it'll just delete those and so here you can see same thing, it's calling delete on um, using the filter we specified and you can see those rows are now gone. Um, you can do the same thing with um, time objects in here. So again it knows how to convert that uh, into the proper SQL, prints out the correct rows. Um, same thing with ranges with time objects. So a um, couple more examples. I took this zip database from uh, zips on SourceForge. Same thing, connecting to SQLite database on disk. Uh, you can see in here again in this block I'm saying if the state is in this array and again knows to do an inquiry. There's a lot of nice methods like group and count which will do the grouping and the counting. I want to reverse them and show the top five cities. So you can see the top five cities, the first one's blank so we can go ahead and add another where city. So um, there's two ways of doing these queries. You can do chaining where you're basically chaining on your data set or you can do a query block which basically you give it a block and then it looks a lot like SQL. And so this thing is a data set and then I'm calling dot print on that data set. So same thing, these are the top cities in the country. And um, there's also models that are built on top of um, these data sets. So basically you can define a model and say this model is tied to this data set. So I'm giving this data set basically that takes the zips, zip codes and pulls out all the states and makes a model out of it. So I can print 10 of the states and you know it prints out 10 of the states. So you can uh, find out more about SQL. There's a Google code project. Um, it has a bunch of wiki pages with a lot of documentation. There's also uh, rdocs on the Ruby Ford site. Um, there's a cheat sheet wiki with a lot of useful information on here. There's a great Google group. Um, the, the latest release, SQL 1.3 also has support for associations, active record style. Uh, and there's also a uh, IRC channel, SQL on Freenode. So check it out. It's awesome.
Okay, so I, everybody seems to have their own way of doing um, their own migrations plugins for Active Record because uh, nobody seems to like the defaults very much because they usually have a lot of problems with working on, when you're working on teams, you just run into issues. Uh, I've seen some cool ones out there like auto migrations and ones that deal with timestamps and all this other stuff. This is just my spin on things. Um, essentially, the way I look at things is from a database point of view, your database does not evolve linearly. In general, your database evolves as a series uh, or as a set of uh, distinct modules. So you may have the base core system of your application as one module, you may have permissionings as a separate module and related tables to that uh, for like uh, RBAC schemas or whatnot. You may also have a set of tables dealing with uh, addresses and contacts and all that other stuff. And of course users and whatnot. So what I did is I have the active record um, migration branches and I can't see a thing on this thing. So um, with the plugin, if you do script generate, let's see if I got it. Oh God, this is awful. Uh, migration branches, it'll come in and it'll give you uh, information on the migration branches. And anyways, how it's used is you do script generate migration branches and you pass it the migration name followed by the branch name and what you're not seeing here is you can pass it any number, well this is the current API, I'm likely to change it but and you can pass it any number of migration names followed by branch names and it just creates the migrations for in each branch. So a couple quick examples. To create sessions in a system, you might do script generate migration branches sessions system. So if I do that, oh. So if I do that, what it's going to do is it's going to create DB migrate system directory because it wasn't there already and then it's going to create uh, 001 create sessions within this. So basically it's namespacing your uh, migrations for active record. Uh, and so you could do like uh, roles and permissions uh, all as maybe part of your system or whatever and it's just going to go and create these migrations in the system branch. Um, and so you see that the, it's just like having normal active record migrations but now your name's based in the branch. Um, you can create two migrations in say a users branch at the same time by saying users, users and user preferences in the users branch and it creates them. Um, also you can create um, two different migrations within uh, different branches even during in the same command currently. So uh, I created a states table in the lookup. I created addresses and address types in the addresses namespace or migrations branch. So that's all neat, but uh, this is an actual application that I've been kind of playing with. If I look in the DB migrate directory, we see we have uh, addresses, lookup tables, uh, RWS is actually the application specific tables. Uh, billing system, RBAC for the uh, roles and rights and stuff, and a systems table. So, in, let me make sure I database is empty first. Okay. So, if I migrate on this, what I see is it didn't do anything. Because in the DB migrate directory, there are no migrations. So, by default, it migrates along the standard Rails migration path. Um, okay, so if, now if you want to migrate a certain branch, all you do is rake db migrate branches equals branch name. So I did that up there with the um, branches equals system. And what it did is it created, uh, I have a migration in there called fast sessions and that migrated that. So it, that's one 
branch. You can specify multiple branches by comma separating them. So if I want to migrate along the lookup and RBAC branches, I just look up commas RBAC and you, what you'll see is that, this is awful. What you'll see is that it migrated DB migrate uh, lookup there first. So I've got some lookup tables, services, statuses, uh, periods, positions, etc. And then it also um, went to the RBAC and it created uh, some RBAC based tables for this application. And there's also, of course, uh, you can migrate all branches by doing rake DB migrate branches all equals all. And there's quite a few of them actually. Um, so it just goes through all of those subdirectories and in alphabetical order currently and will migrate them. Um, so what this uh, allows you to do is you can separate system out into logical components. New feature, um, what this is kind of cool for is new feature development can be kept separate and once the new feature is ready and the, you're sure those migrations are good, you can um, merge them in with the main uh, migrations for the application or you can keep them separate and label the branch name based on that feature and once they're good, they're good. Um, each developer could have his own branch uh, to play around with uh, migrations and stuff so that he can see what he is affecting with his migrations and once he's proved that his migration does its task, he can merge it in with the, the appropriate branch or the mainstream branch and of course whatever else you can think of. I put it up on GitHub. It's uh, github.com slash Wayne E. Seguin. Uh, you can hit me up on IRC uh, under that nick as well. Uh, slash AR underscore migration underscore branches. Um, patches are most definitely welcome. Uh, this is basically evolved to the point where I need it and I'd be happy to add good functionality to it. So any questions? Nope. Cool. Let's get out of here. I've been challenged to do this in 60 seconds once I have my screen up, so we'll see if I can. Uh, first of all, where can I plug in my screen? What do you need? Uh, looks like a, just a regular VGA out. Yep. There we go. Okay, it doesn't look like it's up yet, sorry. Hopefully this won't mess with the windows that I already have open. Is it there? No? Dang it. I knew this would happen. I'll just talk real quick then. Uh, what I was going to present on and what I will still present on though you can't see it is uh, granular testing in Rails. How many of you have gone and run your Rails rake test and had it take two, five minutes to run. How many of you are ADD like me? Do you wait two to five minutes or do you go read a blog post? <laughs> what I've written is just a small rake test that you put in your libtasks directory that will let you run specific unit tests, specific uh, functional tests like rake, test units, and then model name. And it'll run just the test for that model. Um, it's, all it does is it goes through uh, globs the directory, takes the file names, shortens them, makes a description, creates a rake task and puts it in so you can see it with rake-t, you run it, it runs that single test and that's all there is to it. Uh, I can't show you code, if you want it, email me, jacob at mosey.com and uh, I guess that'll be it since I can't show you anything. Have, good, have dinner. <laughs>